what I'm getting from you is that um, no one company dominates the entire supply chain. No. It's just impossible for that it's to impossible. be the case. Uh, no one what, country dominate either. Uh, yeah, well, that was my other question. So is it, um, would it be in theory possible for one country to, uh, to develop uh, control of the entire supply chain from start to finish and produce a cutting edge chip? Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Karis Templeman. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, uh, and I'm joined today uh, by Professor Philip Wong. Uh, Professor Wong is the Willard R. and Inez Kerr Bell Professor in the School of Engineering at Stanford University. Uh, he has been here since uh, 2004 as a professor of electrical engineering. Prior to that, uh, from 1988 to 2004, he was with IBM in the TJ Watson Research Center. Uh, and most important for today's conversation, uh, from 2018 to 20, he was on leave from Stanford uh, and was the vice president of corporate research at TSMC, uh, the largest semiconductor pure fab foundry in the world. Uh, and since 2020, he remains uh, in a consulting advisory role with TSMC. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about a chapter that he and another engineering professor, uh, Jim Plummer, uh, have co-authored uh, that's part of our Semiconductor Working Group Report. Uh, the title of that chapter is Implications of Technology Trends in the Semiconductor Industry. Uh, thanks again for joining me today, Phil. Um, Happy to and, be here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I just wanted to start off today's uh, conversation by uh, noting that uh, you're uh, probably the foremost expert in our group on uh, the actual engineering process of semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to start today by talking a little bit about uh, what semiconductors are. Um, I imagine not all of our audience is an expert in this area. I'm certainly not. And so uh, when we think about semiconductor chips, um, they're not all just one thing. Uh, the report uh, chapter that you wrote uh, lays out that there's logic, memory, and discrete analog and other, or DAOS. Um, uh, so how do these chips differ? Uh, what are the different things that they do? Okay, well, uh, thank you, Karis. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, chat with you. The, the first, uh, first question, what is semiconductors? Uh, first. And uh, recently, I I saw some uh, comments about oh, why semiconductor, why not a full conductor? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the full conductor better than semiconductor? <laughs> okay, so semiconductors refers to a, a class of material that is somewhat conducting. That's what it was semi, and you can actually use electrical means to turn uh, turn that into a conducting state, or you can use the same means to turn this into a non-conducting state. And that is similar to flipping a switch in, let's say, your household uh, light switch. You can turn it on, turn it off. And the switch uh, is basically the heart of all the computation that you that's happening in computers, in your cell, in your cell phones, in all kinds of things, or even you, know, you want to roll up the windows of a car, or you turn on a switch, right? and uh, not a physical switch, but an electrical switch. So that's basically what the semiconductors are about. It's sort of a shorthand for electronic devices that are really tiny and that could uh, be served as a switch. And that could also become uh, turned into devices that can store information, store ones and zero, uh, that's memory devices, they can also be used for many other things, and I'll go on to talk about that. So um, as far as uh, where semiconductors are used, basically anything that requires uh, electricity, uh, things that you plug into the wall with a, uh, with a plug in a, a wall, is a socket in the wall, or something to use a, a battery to power it up, you know, batteries for, you know, uh, cell phones, uh, batteries for cars, right? And uh, cars run the batteries these days. So anything that uses electricity uh, probably has a chip in there. So that means that 
well, we use electricity everywhere from uh, things that like refrigerators or uh, the things that move like cars or things you put in the pocket. So basically everything that we use. So semiconductors are basically everywhere. And to take it into the semiconductor products, you can roughly divide them into several types. One is what we call logic devices, namely things that you do to compute. And the other one is memory devices, uh, things that you use to store information. And those are, there are actually two classes, one that stores information somewhat temporarily, and uh, the other one is stores uh, information for a longer time. And you can think of it as long-term memory or short-term memory, right? And the third kind is a little bit diverse, and it covers a wide range of things uh, from uh, devices that can handle very high power or high voltages, uh, uh, those that you use in, uh, for example, in, uh, in uh, power systems uh, that uh, transmit and store power energy and uh, or uh, the sensors and actuators, uh, sensors that senses uh, either light or temperature or your motion, those are sensors and, act and also actuators that actuate things that turn things like motors and things like that. And, um, and of course, image sensors one prime example of sensors. Uh, we're doing this uh, video conference in here that uses an image sensor, which basically is a semiconductor chip. And we call, uh, from an industry point of view, we kind of lump all these eclectic the chips together into what we call specialty uh, technologies, uh, specialty semiconductors. So basically three kinds logic that do computation and uh, memory that stores information because you need information to compute and the specialty which is an eclectic collection of everything else uh basically right okay so thanks for that primer um let me now ask um are there different companies that have the lead or are the the have market dominant market share in those different types of chips or is TSMC, the dominant uh, producer of all of those. Okay. Oh, yes. Um, so let me just preface it by saying that I'm speaking today as a professor from Stanford, not endorsing any company in particular. But since you asked about, is there any companies that is uh, uh, kind of dominant in those field? And then and I don't think I'm seeing anything confidential or or or, or anything that you can find them in 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 public uh, available documents. So in terms of logic, uh, clearly you probably see in the news that companies like uh, foundries, uh, foundries are basically companies that produce these semiconductor chips, uh, actually manufacture those uh, semiconductor chips um, that uh, TSMC in Taiwan is the leader, market leader right now uh, with a very large market share. And the other uh, leading companies are Intel and Samsung. Uh, Intel is based in the US, Samsung is based in uh, Korea. In terms of memory chips, uh, there's uh, a variety of com companies, uh, Korean companies like SK Hynix and Samsung are market, uh, have a lot of market shares and as well as Micron technologies in, in the US. And also in Japan, there's Kyosha, uh, which uh, formerly was from Toshiba and Kosha uh, collaborated jointly with uh, Western Digital uh, in the US. So those are the kind of major companies that are in memory and logic space. In terms of specialty, because it's a, a really eclectic collection of uh, companies, there's a, just a variety of companies everywhere. For example, for analog um, kind of the devices uh, and there's uh, there is analog devices in the, in the, in Massachusetts there is uh, Texas instruments in Texas and of course TSMC produce a lot of these uh, specialty technologies as well and uh, of course oh I forgot about the in the in the logic space uh, of course uh, global foundries in the US also is a player. And global foundries also play a lot into these specialty technologies as well. So it's kind of like roughly the landscape. If I miss any particular companies, my apologies ahead of time. <laughs> but you know, roughly this kind of landscape. Okay. 
Great. Um, if I understand you correctly, you were describing uh, companies that uh, manufacture the chips, but uh, as uh, our audience may or may not know, uh, much of the work of designing chips is done by different firms. So uh, could you talk a little bit about the difference between design houses and uh, fabs or foundries? Oh, yes, Karen, I'm really glad you brought this out because this is one of the major source of confusion in the, in the media and also in public discussions. When I read a, um, a news article or uh, listen to a news in a news forum, they often say uh, chip companies and, and they'll say, okay, chip companies, XYZ to produce these chips. But well, oftentimes um, they didn't make a clear distinction about the design of the chip versus the manufacturing of the chip. Now, oftentimes in the in the in the media, people will say, "Oh, chip companies such as Nvidia and uh, Qualcomm and uh, AMD and so on make these chips." Now, I would actually argue with them; they did not make the chips. <laughs> <laughs> the design just so oftentimes you read oh uh, chip makers like Nvidia and Qualcomm those are and those are a great source of confusion because they, they are not chip makers they're chip designers they don't make the chips it is Intel Global Foundry Samsung Foundry TSMC those uh, those make the chips so we have to make that decision very clear because that call that creates an impression that uh, American companies such as NVIDIA, AMD, and uh, Qualcomm, and so on, are leaders in chip making, which uh, is a little bit of confusion, and that is uh, not uh, appropriate. So uh, you, to answer your question, the chip designers, um, there are uh, actually two kinds of chip designers. Uh, one is the chip designing companies that uh, make market-facing, customer-facing uh, uh, products. And you can include in them um, Apple, for example. They design chips that go into cell phones, uh, computers, and so on. And uh, as a consumer, uh, you could buy them and so on. And same thing with NVIDIA. They make uh, uh, graphics chips. You can plug them into your computer and play games with it and uh, fancy video games. And those are products that you can buy directly uh, uh, from them. And there are the fabulous uh, uh, chip makers, well, not chip makers, chip designers that uh, design chips, but then they go into someone else's system. Right? Uh, for example, Qualcomm. They design chips that goes into the cell phone. Qualcomm does not make the cell phone themselves. Uh, they provide chips for cell phone manufacturers to use the chip, and then they go into the cell phone that uh, that people buy. So there's this, you know, little bit of distinction between two kinds of chip designers, also, and the companies are very really, uh, like Apple and even. You know, Tesla, they are making cars and Tesla designed their own chips. And so those are companies we designed their own chips for their own system. To this we call, you know, industry, they call them, call them system companies. Uh, they built the systems. And then there are the uh, other chip, uh, fabulous uh, chip designing companies that uh, design chips that go into systems. Uh, got companies such as Qualcomm, Broadcom, uh, uh, many of those uh, 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 companies that will uh, uh, that are designing these chips for people to, uh, to, to put into a actual system. Uh, it didn't always used to be the case that these two activities were separate. And in fact, Intel, from what I understand, still designs some of the chips that they manufacture. That's right. Um, but the large majority now of chips are designed by one company and manufactured by another. So uh, why the separation? What are the business advantages of doing the designing in one place and just specializing in that versus the manufacturing and specializing in that? Absolutely. Going back in time, as the, at the beginning of the semiconductor industry, everybody is doing everything in the same place, uh, including 
at the early at the earlier times you know, before my time, companies like IBM would make their own uh, semiconductor manufacturing machines, and then they will make the machines. The machines will make the chips. The chips will go into the computers, the big iron computers that they said that the system three hundred and sixty uh, in this in the sixties uh, and seventies. And so the companies would do everything from top to bottom. As time go on, uh, companies realize that hmm, they are not very good at doing everything. They probably are very good at doing something, but not everything. So then the industry started to differentiate. To there will be companies who are very good at making equipment for making chips. There are companies who are good at making chips itself. There are companies who design the chips. And there are companies who actually put the chips into our systems. And the various companies would pick various combinations that they are good at and to do that. And so for companies that they would do design and make the chips themselves, they would call them uh, sometimes it's, uh, you see something called integrated device manufacturer, the IDMs. And those classes of, uh, of uh, companies are like Intel and uh, previously IBM does that. And uh, 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 Texas Instruments for them, for example, for their uh, analog products, they do that themselves. And analog devices do it the same way. So those are the IDMs, uh, integrated device and manufacturers. And then uh, somewhere in the 80s, uh, people realized that uh, uh, it would be more, from running the business point of view, more efficient to separate the design and the manufacturing of the chip. And there rise what they call the foundry model, namely uh, your companies will, will be specializing on the design, there's somebody who specializes on the manufacturing, and therefore deriving larger efficiency in running the companies and, uh, and, uh, and uh, running the business. So that's the foundry fabulous split that occurred uh, around the mid, uh, uh, early to mid eighties. And, uh, and uh, a prime example of that is the, uh, is the founding of the TSMC in Taiwan by Morris Chen. Uh, who used to be working, who used to work at uh, Texas Instruments, which is a integrated device manufacturer. Right. Um, thanks for that explanation. I hope our audience could follow that. I think you, you did a very good job explaining the difference there. Um, I want to touch on one more distinction before I shift direction, uh, and that is the difference between uh, what are sometimes referred to as leading edge chips or uh, kind of the, the newest uh, design for chips and mature or legacy chips. Uh, can you tell us or walk us through a little bit what the difference is between those two categories? Yeah, very good. And let me explain uh, the difference between leading edge chip and legacy chip first. And then I would lead to, for the legacy chip, there are two branches that I need to explain because it often get conflated and and therefore, the discussion about legacy script chip got mixed up, <laughs> and that, that's not good. Uh, the difference is uh, for leading edge chip, that means that you are the, at the leading edge of the technology development and research. So this is the newest product, the fastest, the most energy efficient uh, computing chips that you can find. For example, you buy a phone and uh, the this year you have a phone, and next year you have a newer model of the phone that has longer battery life, can do more things because they have the newest generation of chips. So those system products will often drive the development of the of these uh, leading edge products, and those are the most advanced, most expensive uh, products, semiconductor chip products that you can find. And so that's the leading edge chip. And then you can all, you oftentimes hear uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, names such as five nanometer chips, three nanometer chips, and so on and so forth. And those are just uh, labels for these technology products, such as you, you've got a car of uh, model five, model three, model two, and so on and so forth. So you can think of these names as kind of models, right? And, uh, and generally speaking, the smaller the number, the better, right? And that's a long history about that, and we'll, we'll go to go to that sometime later if, uh, when people are interested. But to understand that, 
they are identified by numbers, uh, numbers of nanometers, and then the uh, this model seems to, uh, is generally the better. Okay, so that's the leading edge chip. So the legacy chip means that okay, so now you have a semiconductor foundry or a, some um, integrated device manufacturer to produce a generation of products, and of course, um, then time moves on. A few years later, that particular product that you develop is getting old because there are other newer generations that performs better and higher energy efficiency and so on. But the flip side is these older products, quote unquote, older products are cheaper to manufacture. Now, because we already know how to do this, all the equipment that you use to uh, fabricate the chip or manufacture the chip are all depreciated. So you don't have to pay for depreciation. You're just printing money right now. Um, yeah, so those are what we call the legacy chip, the older generations of technology, the mature, what sometimes you can see, mature node. Uh, node is a name, a, 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 a technical name or you know, uh, uh, for these uh, technology generations. So you can see a mature node or legacy uh, uh, chips. Now, those, among those legacy chips, there are actually two very important distinctions. One is simply older generations of logic chips or memory chips that is just past their prime, <laughs> but they're still useful. <laughs> they're still useful. And, uh, and you use it for because you don't need the performance, you don't need the energy efficiency, and you just one lower cost. And that's one of the main reasons why they're used. Second would be that oftentimes uh, manufacturers would say, okay, now I know how to make these chips. I can use a similar technology as a base and develop other functionality that add on to the original purpose, which is computing. And we have many examples of that and that gives them special capability, such as the image sensor that we we're recording our video on the image sensor. They are done on these mature, what they call mature nodes, but they are not just simple, um, no change uh, uh, the technology. One actually spend a lot of time developing new, adding on new things to it to make it to be able to capture image much better than, be uh, than before or handle higher voltages or make it, make a response to high frequency uh, signals for RF or communications and so on. So people spend a lot of time and resources and energy and spend a lot of research dollars to make that do these other things. But they are based on a previous generation of technology. Why are they based on a previous generation of technology? Because then you're starting from a cheaper base you don't start with really a fancy, uh, a costly uh, platform. You start from a slower cost platform. And, and so that's kind of two different, when people refer to mature node or legacy node, oftentimes they don't make a distinction like that. But this distinction is really important because you do spend a lot of time and energy to develop these other special capabilities. Um, so I want to uh, shift direction a little bit and talk about uh, the kind of evolution of the market for semiconductor chips, uh, and in particular, um, how TSMC as a pure fab foundry company developed what is now a dominance in the leading edge chips as opposed to legacy chips. Um, Intel, from what I understand, used to hold this position until not that long ago. We're talking like a, within the last decade. Um, and then they fell back. Uh, so uh, what happened? What was the kind of secret sauce to TSMC success or, or what kind of missteps, uh, flipping the question around, did Intel uh, uh, take uh, to, to kind of lose this race over the last decade? Yeah, okay, great question. I don't have a lot of insight into how a company actually do their work and so on. So, the, but I, what I could say is that uh, the uh, who, who, which is the kind of technology leader or market leader at any one point is a very um, 
temporary uh, situation. It is a basically the leadership is fleeting. Basically, um, we have right now in the logic space um, three major uh, companies uh, competing for the technology leadership in the logic advanced logic that names namely Intel, Samsung, and TSMC. And they are, I would characterize it as running neck to neck. And uh, and one of them is slightly ahead of the other ones. And uh, I would say at any one point in time, if any company um, do something really fantastic, they could uh, move forward and become the leader. Uh, or flip side, if somebody who uh, makes some mistakes or, uh, or makes some wrong calculations, they could fall behind. So. This is not, I would say, it's not a permanent situation. It is a temporary situation. And just like in a horse race, you can be ahead, you can be slower at any point in time. Yeah. We, 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 there, there's no end point in this race either. <laughs> I should say that. <laughs> right. Um, so that actually raises an interesting question about uh, China, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, so as you know, uh, the PRC is... Uh, pouring a lot of resources into trying to develop its own domestic semiconductor manufacturing capabilities uh, on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies um, with the hope that maybe they can not only join this race, but eventually pull ahead in the race. What do you think of the prospects of that approach? Well, first of all, China has already joined the race uh, many years ago, right? They started their own uh, logic foundry, uh, specifically SMIC and several other smaller foundries as well. They also started some mem memory companies like CXMT for DRAM, for making memory devices, and also uh, YMTC uh, to make uh, NAND flash, the long-term data storage devices. They're already in the race, right? And um, they started a little bit early, later than the rest of the world. And so as homing kind of staying on the analogy of a race, uh, you have a marathon and somebody started first and uh, somebody started later. So I would imagine it would take a little bit of time for somebody to, uh, that started later to catch up to the rest of the world. And how much, as far as how much time it would take, it's really a strong function of a number of uh, a variety of function uh, of uh, of uh, 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 in, in, uh, kind of parameters: uh, uh, availability of talent, availability of capital, management uh, uh, systems, and so on. It's really hard to say. And uh, in this in this race, they are clearly behind the rest of the world right now as far as how what kind of things they could do to accelerate in their, uh, their uh, progress is really uh, a variety of things. Uh, putting in capital or investment is one thing, but it's not the only thing. Okay, um, do you think, uh, um, going back to this definite, this distinction between legacy and cutting edge chips, um, uh, what we've, heard and seen a lot about is uh, China's potential for dominating some of the older technologies, some of the legacy chips, in part because that's uh, less profitable and the kind of leading horses in the race, to continue this analogy, aren't paying too much attention to it or aren't devoting a lot of resources to that. But those chips are still very, very important. They're included in many of the electronics, the, the products that we use on a daily basis. Um, so do you share that concern? Do you think uh, there's a, a chance that uh, PRC companies could move in and, and dominate uh, a particular part of the chip space, even if it's not a leading edge chip? I think it is um, uh, a, 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 no, very well possible. And, uh, um, and this scenario is basically a business decision. It's not so much a technology, uh, not gated by technology, because those older technologies, the, the ways to manufacture them and the way to design and manufacture are pretty well known. And so there's not really anything that prevents any particular country or regions, uh, in fact, uh, 
uh, doesn't limit is is not limited to China. It could be in one day, maybe Vietnam or whatever. Or Brazil could uh, uh, one day do this, and uh, as well. So it is not a matter of technology uh, capability. It's a matter of business uh, situation. So if they could, if one country or one region could create a business environment that allow them to uh, dominates the market, I can see, totally see that happening. Let's talk a little bit about the supply chain uh, that goes into manufacturing chips. Um, we sometimes see in the papers or in um, comments from people who don't know this industry well that uh, chips are the new oil. They're geopolitically important. Uh, you can seize chips and then you dominate um, the kind of leading technology that will build the economy of the future. Uh, what do you think of that analogy? Are chips the new oil, or is there something more to this? Oh, there's definitely a lot more to, uh, more to that. Uh, when people say chips are new oil, I, buy, I, I agree with that notion that it is uh, as important as oil, in the terms of oil is a source of energy that the entire world depends on, and chips is runs basically the, the entire world uh, from uh, from your rolling up your windows <laughs> in the car to doing the most advanced computation uh, for AI and uh, for uh, uh, chips for 5Gs. And uh, those, uh, in that sense, yes. At the same time, uh, chips are very different from oil. And you can maybe, uh, I talk about it in some of my uh, uh, advocacy for chips also, which is chips needs to continually advance in order to show its value, in order to provide its value to society. And oil, um, they have been in the ground for millions of years and they never changed, although one could argue that the technology to explore the oil do change, but the oil itself does not change. And so the, um, the chips, for example, you can stockpile a lot of oil, uh, you know, Put a stockpile in there, and if you need, in case of emergency, you can just draw upon the, the stockpile, which the U.S. does also, and many countries do. But to stockpile chips is only effective to a certain extent because technology will get old. Um, you would, would you like to stockpile your your cell phone so that you you don't have to buy cell phone for another ten years? You would not, because the technology advances. These chips can do more things into the future. So you cannot stockpile chips uh, to, a certain, to, a, to a certain extent. You can stockpile for a little while, and that works, but which is what China is doing right now. They're stockpiling a lot of chips in, in, uh, in, uh, in anticipation of a more uh, restrictions and export control and so on. But it, it, it only works for us to a certain extent. So that's the real difference, play a difference between uh, like oil, and, uh, and chips, you need to constantly renew it. And therefore the research and development of chips is just as important as the manufacturing of the chip uh, because of this particular uh, 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 attribute. Because if you move a, a, a fabrication facility in, 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 let's say in the US, you only have the capability to run to fabricate this particular kinds of chip and you have no way to provide a future chips. Right, um, so that I'd like to segue into talking a little bit about the, the parts of the uh, manufacturing process. So uh, you've noted there's design, development, fabrication, and then testing and assembly. And all of those may be done in different places by different companies. So um, are there particular parts of that supply chain that are are especially vulnerable to disruption or that are um, especially on the other hand resilient and, and very diffused around the world that are easy to enter versus not um, could you walk us through a little bit the kind of the economics of uh, the chip supply chain yeah so let's talk about supply chain itself first right the chain consists of a long, really long chain, uh, starting from the basic material. You need to mine the material, you need to purify it, and you, 
the materials itself and also the materials that you use to fabricate the chips, uh, chemicals and gases and so on. So starting from that, you've got materials and then you have manufacturing equipment that produce the that you, that you use to produce the chip. Uh, you take an analogy of a kitchen, you need to go to the market to buy the material, you need to have a a, a, a a, a kitchen that has a stove, that has an oven and, and, and pots and pans, those are the equipment. And then you need to have you need to have companies that develop the technology. Uh, they need a chef that could come up with a recipe, right? And then you will have a uh, 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 you need to manufacture those, uh, those chips, and that's the manufacturing uh, aspects of it. And, and keeping on the analogy of a restaurant or a kitchen, you have a chef who come up with a, with a with a recipe and uh, uh, nice dishes. But then you have a franchise of restaurant, right? You need to, then you need to have the manufacturer of those food, uh, you know, a new burger or whatever, right? And then uh, after the chips, and then you have the designing of the chip. How do you configure the chip? Now you want to you want to have a burger that has a a, a tomato on the top, a tomato on the bottom. You know, that's different, right? So the uh, the, the design of the chip, and then you have the system uh, companies who use the chips do something useful, right? So this is an entire chain. And, uh, and along the chain, there are many companies that provide the tools to do things, uh, tools to manufacture chips, tools to design the chips. And those, those are all part of the chain. So now when we talk about a supply chain, that means that if one link of the chain is broken, you already have a broken supply chain. Doesn't matter if the rest of the chain is intact or continuous, you just need one point, it's broken, then you cannot make anything. So in other words, any particular part of the supply chain is broken, you don't have a, a complete supply chain and you have a, a big problem, okay? So that's part. As far as um, the various pieces of the supply chain, and you probably see in the many discussions in the public media that, um, some countries or regions are really good at doing certain things. Uh, for example, in Japan, they're very good at materials and, uh, and also uh, uh, semiconductor equipment. In the U.S., the major semiconductor, there are uh, many major semiconductor equi uh, manufacturing equipment companies. Also, electronic design automation tools to help design uh, chips in a very efficient way. They're all kind of headquarters and based in, in the US. And, um, and also many of the system companies uh, who put together chips and design chips and also put together systems are based in the US. Many of them are in the Bay Area here, right near Stanford. So those are the kind of strengths that, um, that various regions would have. For example, in the, in the Netherlands, they have a very dominant company that makes a uh, what they call the photography machine, who uh, is part of the manufacturing process of the uh, chips. And uh, in, in, uh, in Korea and in Taiwan, they are very strong in manufacturing those chips. In Korea, they manufacture the memory chips. In Taiwan, they manufacture the logic chips. And um, so there's uh, this supply chain, and there are globally, there are regions that are good at it. But it doesn't mean that uh, once you, you know, deleted that region out of the picture, then you're a bit quickly in trouble. You could be in trouble temporarily on a short-term basis, but I think uh, the, if any supply chain is uh, disrupted, um, then uh, and, uh, in most cases, the, uh, the rest of the business community will come together and fill in those spaces because then if somebody is deleted out of it, you created a vacuum, and so um, and uh, over time. Now the question is over what time, right? So some will take longer, some will take shorter, and uh, over time that space will be filled in. All right. So what I'm getting from you is that um, no one company dominates the entire supply chain. No. It's just impossible for that it's to impossible. be the case. Uh, no one what, country dominate either. Uh, yeah, well, that was my other question. So is it, um, would it be in theory possible for one country to uh, to develop uh, control of the entire supply chain from start to finish and produce 
a cutting edge chip? I would argue that no. Uh, okay. that the, the, the supply chain is so diverse and so complicated uh, that uh, no one country or region is uh, big enough uh, and robust enough to contain, to be completely self-contained. Okay, so uh, follow-up question on that then. Um, we sometimes see in the reporting on Taiwan, uh, cross-strait relations with the PRC, and TSMC's kind of central position in the uh, chip supply chain that if the PRC were ever to take over Taiwan and control TSMC itself, that would give them uh, dominance in uh, the, the manufacture, at least, of chips. Do you... Does that follow or does the supply chain that TSMC relies on, uh, is that too complex to be replicated just within uh, a PRC Taiwan uh, kind of ecosystem? I think that, uh, that that's the scenario that you describe, which probably is described by many in the, in the, in the discussion is uh, uh, entirely impossible. Uh, because for several reasons. One is for the reason that you just described. This is supply chain is so complex that um, this, any particular company would rely on the rest of the supply chain to be completely operational. And, uh, and so uh, if, they, if the rest of the supply chain is absent or not cooperating with that particular uh, company or that region, that is not gonna, be, the company is not gonna be able to operate. That's the first question. That's the first kind of uh, degree. Now, a further consideration, which most uh, discussions like that uh, did not go into, is that is this the level of trust in the, uh, in the, that is required in this business. Uh, for example, in a foundry, you would have uh, many, many thousands of customers, and they many of the customers are competing with against each other. And the way they, a foundry work is that they need to work with all the customers. Many of them compete with each other. So what does that mean? That means that the customers have to really trust the foundry in collaborating with them in terms of products roadmap, in terms of new inventions that maybe they are still cooking within the, sale, within the company, but they're not willing to disclose to other people, especially their competitors. So foundry really needs to be have this really high degree of trust between the foundry and the people who use the foundry. And so if a entity is not no longer trusted, it would not allow them to be a viable foundry. I'm really glad you said that word. And uh, it's something that we've been emphasizing a lot in our discussions around this report that a trust is such a key part of this industry. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm tempted to quote from uh, the, the late George Schultz, the former Secretary of State, who was a distinguished uh, senior fellow here at Hoover. His favorite catchphrase was, trust is the coin of the realm. Uh, and so um, I want to pivot a little bit uh, in the last couple of minutes we have here to, uh, to talk about the future of the semiconductor industry uh, and to talk about how the this future might be developed, who's going to be involved in it. Um, and I want to ask you, first off, is Moore's law dead? So the idea that we're going to have a doubling of computing power every two years or so, we're going to see this uh, continual shrinking of what you can put on and uh, what can be fit on a single chip, um, it is, is that process played out? Uh, and if so, where do we go now from here on out? Great question. And, uh, well, I, I, this is a cliche now, but it is really a wonderful question because this, this topic has been discussed and there has been so much confusion about what actually people mean by Moore's Law and whether Moore's Law is dead or alive. Uh, to me, it doesn't matter. That is really, is really irrelevant. Okay, let me, let me explain. Um, the, in the past, maybe like 50 years or so, 
Um, we have seen a tremendous improvement in semiconductor technologies, both in terms of the capability and the amount of things that it does, and also energy efficiency and uh, speed and so on, that uh, we would uh, we have reaped a lot of benefits from these ad ad advances in technology, mostly driven by the uh, need from society, because uh, new capability and new energy efficiencies are desired in many of the products that companies produce. So I expect that to continue to happen. And in fact, not only to continue, but even accelerate because we have been so now so dependent on continual advances of our technology. And many of the, of the technologies are dependent, are founded upon semiconductor technology, we talk about quantum computing, we talk about 5G, 6G, we talk about uh, AI, those all need semiconductor technologies to make their advances. So I expect the applications and the uses of semiconductor technology and therefore the impact of semiconductor technology in society to actually grow faster than before. And so there's a great need. And as you know, when there's a great need, Innovation comes, right? When there's a great need, innovation comes and there will be business opportunity. So I think those will not only continue on a path before, but actually accelerate because of the great need and great benefit that comes from it. Now, to the next question of how do you get those advances? In the past 50 years, we would, let me draw an analogy. We would like walking inside a tunnel the way to, that semiconductor technology achieved its advances was by shrinking the transistors or the, the semiconductors from bigger ones to smaller ones. And that path has been so successful in the past 50 years that we are like walking inside a tunnel. That's the only thing you need to do. Going forward, we will know exactly what to do, no other, no other methods or innovations required, just over there. Now we are at the exit of the tunnel. We, this path, just not everything that we do, any tool, any techniques, always saturate. And we reach kind of the end point of using this methodology. We're at the exit of the tunnel. Now there are two ways to interpret this. At the end of the, at the exit of the tunnel, you fall off the cliff and you're dead. You make no progress. Another interpretation is, at the exit of the tunnel, you're not bound by the tunnel. You can go anywhere you want. And I think that's the excitement in semiconductor technology right now. We are at the exit of the tunnel. There are many ways to go. And because there is a strong need and innovation will come, and those innovations are not confined by what you can do in the past 50 years. OK, so uh, I'm going to hope, I'm going to assume we're in the second of those scenarios where you can go any direction and we've got this boundless uh, set of possibilities. Um, but one of the things we also know about innovation is that there are benefits to cooperation, right? To uh, working with partners uh, across the world. Uh, and the more minds looking at a difficult problem, the better, uh, especially the more uh, diversity of uh, backgrounds and approaches that you bring into looking at a problem. So is there uh, any possibility that we could um, kind of build uh, a, a consortium or a collective that works on this problem that crosses a lot of these national boundaries, but that still maintains the basic level of trust that you mentioned before? Absolutely. I, the, I'm glad you mentioned that because as I, I said before, Manufacture of chips depends on continual improvement and continual improvement requires research and development. And now what makes good research and development? And that is the collaboration across different regions, different expertise is clearly important, right? There, no one university is best in, in, in research and, that, and that you need many other universities to advance knowledge and that's the same way with semiconductors and you need many participants across the world across the region and we have seen many good examples of such collaborations uh happens really well 
for example, within, within the U.S. Actually, this is actually outside the U.S. as well. The Semiconductor Research Corporation, which uh, pull money from industry and fund university research, has been operating for the past maybe 20, 30 years. And it has a model for uh, a uh, well-defined objective and, and, uh, and making a lot of progress in, in, in semiconductors. So those are one example. And another example, like uh, and, uh, uh, the Inter-University Microelectronics uh, Center, or IMEC uh, in Belgium, those are a big consortium of industry that do re, uh, advanced development together, together as a collection of, uh, as a consortium. So those are very successful examples of international collaborations. And I believe that um, if the, the world could come together and coordinate and collaborate on the further R&D of uh, semiconductors, we will uh, be advancing the technology much faster than before. Great. On that note, Philip, um, I think we're just about out of time, so I'll bring our conversation to a close. Thanks again for speaking with me. Uh, to our audience, I'll just uh, repeat, I'm Karis Templeman. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and I've been speaking with Philip Wong, a professor of engineering at uh, Stanford as well. Um, and we've been talking about uh, his co-authored chapter with Jim Plummer entitled Implications of Technology Trends in the Semiconductor Industry. Thanks for listening. And uh, we encourage you to check out the report of which this chapter is a part entitled Silicon Triangle, the United States, Taiwan, China, and Semiconductor Security. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I'm Karis Templeman. Silicon Triangle is a special podcast series of matters of policy and politics. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we generate and promote ideas advancing freedom. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.